here. My name is Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here in Eber, and we are grateful for the opportunity to worship with you this morning. Um, as we just gather Sunday after Sunday, um, right? We, we know that Sundays are important. They're, they're significant. It's a time where our church family comes together uh, to make much of Jesus. But, but it's not the only time in the week that the Lord speaks. Um, and so we want to, to celebrate the fact that as you gather together, as you met with Jesus, as you've opened up the scriptures, that God is faithful to work and to move and to teach and to reveal um, Monday through Saturday as well. And then on Sundays that we get together together to make much of Jesus. And so we haven't come to church. This building, this time of the week is not church. Um, we're the church, right? The people of God who are trusting, treasuring, falling after, falling after, uh, making much of Jesus. That, that is, that's what the church is. So if you haven't been with us before, thank you for being here. Um, we do tend to start a few minutes late um, every week. That's pretty normal at this point. Um, kids stay in for the first couple songs. We do that intentionally. We know it can get a little rowdy occasionally, but we do it because we want them growing up knowing they're a part of this church family. Um, that we want them asking about the songs that we're singing. We want them to ask about words they don't know. We want them to ask who is it that we're singing to or who is it that we're raising our hands to. And it's good for our own hearts, right, to be reminded that, that families have kids and that God has given us kids um, physically and he's given us um, life spiritually as well. But prior to the sermon, kids kindergarten and down We'll head down this hallway for child care for the remainder of the service. Our elementary age kids have a class every other week. This week they're in the service, so on either side of the stage, there's some worship notebooks to kind of help them follow along with the sermon. Um, and then this week, at the end of the week, um, so I want to go ahead and give you a heads up on it. On Friday, our students, so our 6th through 12th graders, are headed to camp. And would love for you just to be in prayer for them as they head to Gloria, New Mexico. Um, some of our sponsors, that the Lord would just would speak. If you've ever been on any sort of camp or retreat, you know that when you kind of unplug from the world for a couple of days, um, when you don't have a phone, when, when the normal rhythms of life are gone, that the Lord just tends to work and to move and to speak clearly. And so we're asking Him to do that amongst our students for their good and for His glory. And then I think Carmen's got one announcement, and then we'll pray. Yes, on Thursday this week, we have our second Women's Summer Hangout, and this is going to be dinner at the Plaza, so we would love for you to come. Um, we've got a sign-up sheet at the back that you can use, and also you can text in your confirmation that you're coming, your RSVP, as it were, to um, Mary Grace at 940-395-5991, that's on this little sheet. Um, that will also come out in the text message this week if you signed up for text reminders. Um, but we would love for you to join us for dinner at the Plaza at 7 o'clock. Please, please, please get your RSVP in by Wednesday afternoon so we can figure out if we need to like reserve part of the back room or just get a big table in the middle. Um, so let us know um, either on the sign-up sheet or by RSVP to the text message. All right, let's pray. Father, as we gather this morning, Lord, there are so many thoughts running through our minds, so many concerns um, from the past week or going into the new week, um, relationships that, that, that need tweaking, um, fears about money, or just there's so much. And yet this morning, you see each and every one of us know what's circling our hearts, you know what's going on in our minds, and so God, we just would ask that you would minister to us, that you would help still our hearts and minds to behold you this morning, to taste and see that you are good, that you are sufficient, that you are beautiful, and that you would minister, that you would reveal more of yourself, help us to, to cling to you, help us to be rooted in you, and to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel that we've been called to. So this morning, God, would the, would the praises of our mouth edify and glorify you? The Lord, will we not settle that that is all that worship is, but it is the very lives that we live. God, help us to sort through that to make much of you. In 
confused. Amen. Where Abel, we stand as we read through the Lord. The word of the Lord and cause to worship. Psalm 146. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked he brings to ruin. The Lord will reign forever. Your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord.
every Sunday in need of your mercy and grace. Um, Lord, we have sinned in, in so many ways with our actions, um, with our words, with the thoughts of our heart and our intentions. Um, God, we've sinned in ignoring your call to us to, um, to share the gospel with those around us. God, we, we miss opportunities um, to testify to your great love and goodness to us. Um, and Lord, we stand today just in need of your mercy and also in confidence that because of the blood of Christ shed on the cross, um, and because of his, uh, his resurrection and his defeat of sin and death, we stand confident that we will receive mercy and grace from your hand today. Um, so would you remind us, God, of your goodness today? Would you, um, as we look at this last little bit of the wonderful and beautiful gospel of Luke, um, would you challenge us? Um, would you challenge us to live more like Christ? To sacrifice um, the things of the world that we might gain what is truly life. Um, Lord, would you call us to bring ourselves fully before you this morning, that your word might change and impact our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, you guys can have a seat. Our littlest folk staff class down this hallway for child care today. Um, they can just kind of head down that way and follow the signs to their classes. Our bigger kids, first through fifth grade, will be in the service with us today. So they do have some worship notebooks here at the front on either side of the stage to help them follow along with the service. excitement 
and in the room as people are talking over one another. Um, the women have had their experience of the empty tomb. Peter's now had an appearance. These two have had an appearance. And that's the scene where we kind of cut off and left in the middle of that last week. And so we're going to pick up in Luke 24, um, beginning in verse 36. Still in that moment, in this room where everyone is excited and exuberant and exclaiming that they've seen Jesus. And as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled and why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands? That is I, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit doesn't have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they were still, and while they still disbelieved for joy or marveling, he said to them, Have you got anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. Then he says to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. And when he, while he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple praising God. And so Luke who um, has kind of meandered his way through this, right? Like looking to write um, a, an orderly account of the life of Jesus for our benefit, right? To see that we would have assurance that all that, that, that we know about Jesus is right and true. He wraps up these things at the end quite quickly. And so actually verses 36 through 49 um, are, are most likely the same day. The last four verses are a different time, right? Acts 1 lets us know that Jesus um, interacted with folks for 40 days before he ascended to heaven. 1 Corinthians 15 lets us know that he had eventually um, saw 500 plus folks um, and, and made appearances before them. And so those last few verses, the way Luke writes it, it feels like all of this has taken place on that very day that he appeared to them and then ascended that day. That, that's not the case. He's appearing to them. He's teaching them here in this room. And then verse 50 is some 40 days removed. And, and I want us just to note as we begin the kindness of Jesus here. Right? Like as he walks in the room, right, he knows it's going to be startling to them that his initial comment is just peace. Right? Like, hey, it's okay. Right? Breathe. I, I know you're startled. And then that there's no shaming here. There's no, I gotcha, I told you, you know, what we're all thinking. But that just like to, to the, the other disciples on the road to Emmaus, that he then just opens up the scriptures and begins to teach them and to show and to make these connections from the Old Testament, across the Old Testament, from the prophets and the Psalms, the poetry, and from the Torah, the first five books of scripture, who he was and that this has always been plan and the story. And yet Luke lets us know this scene, like the disciples are, are pretty incredulous, like that their minds are literally blown here. Right? Like that, that even as they're speaking, they're initially they're startled and they're frightened, thinking they're seeing like a spirit or that they're hallucinating. Right? Um, and even when Jesus confirms that it's him, look at verse 41. It says they still disbelieve for joy. Here is not really like um, like that they're, they're being stubborn here. It's more like they're labor lost. Where it's just like. And Jesus is like, hey, don't anything to eat. Like, like, hey, stay with me here. Like, it's me. We'll sit down and eat and talk. 
that they're just like, the, the gears are turning a little slow to really figure out this is really happening. And yet in Jesus' appearance here, he's giving some proofs for them, right? Almost anticipating the arguments that would be made, right? So he's allowing them to see him, to hear him, touch him, right? Their senses are involved here as they're seeing him, as they're hearing him, as they're touching him. To see that, it's, that it is a bodily resurrection, right? That others would not be able to say, hey, you know what? Y'all were... Y'all were um, terrified, you were sad, you were grief, and you just hallucinated. You didn't really see Jesus, you had a vision, or you hallucinated. And they're like, no! Like, we touched him. We watched him eat. So, in, in the Jewish belief, an angel doesn't eat, doesn't drink, right? So it's not a vision, it's not a spirit, it's not an angel. There is a bodily resurrection taking place here. But it's not just that it's a bodily resurrection, that, are, that his body is now different, right? In 1 Corinthians 15, if you want to spend some time there this week, Paul talks through the, the physical body and the spiritual body. That the physical body, right, perishes, that it, it wears out, and the spiritual body is eternal, right? And it's different. Jesus is exhibiting some of that, right? That he vanished with the guys in Emmaus, that he just kind of appears, that he's kind of walking through walls, that it's that it is his body, but it's different. It's not the same. Which tells us a second proof. It wasn't that Jesus just swooned and needed to be resuscitated. Right? Coming through the wall lets them know this is his body, but it's not the same body. Right? It's different. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual body, but it's his physical body. It's different. And so listen to how John will write this. This is a 1 John chapter 3. This is, this is beginning of verse 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world doesn't know us is that it doesn't know Him. Listen to verse 2. Beloved, we're God's children now. What we will be has not yet appeared. But we know when He appears and when He returns, we shall be like Him. Because we will, will see him as he is. Right? It's, it's the promise that our bodies right now are finite. They fail. They wear out. They're susceptible to death. But we will receive physical, uh, we will receive new, perfect physical bodies that are different because there will be this spiritual aspect to them. And what we see here in Luke 24 in Jesus' body will one day be ours as well. And so he's allowing them to experience him, to see him, to touch him. He's letting them know that his body, right, is not just a spirit or a hallucination, but that it's not the same body. It is different. It is it's what we're going to long for and hope for. And so, as, as they're experiencing this and trying to figure out what's going on, he basically asks, hey, do I have any leftovers, right? I've got something to eat. And he sits down, and he has a meal with them. And while they're having this meal, he opens their minds to the truths of Scripture. And all these concerns and doubts where they, they expected him to come in and, and physically as a, as a like take over Rome, restore Israel, he's beginning to show the plan and the intent of Scripture. We talked about this last week. Um, this was always the plan. He has fulfilled it, and he's helped them understand it. He opens their mind to it. Verse 45. And he says in verse 46, Thus it is written, that Christ should suffer, and on the third day rise from the dead. And then he begins to mention repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So what's happening here is it's like the veil is being lifted, right? Like, that they just could not quite comprehend all that was taking place in Scripture, right? They just couldn't quite see. And now the veil is it's being lifted and all the synapses are firing, right? All the connections are being made. And Jesus is helping them see the continuity of this. And they're understanding. Listen to how Paul writes about this. This is in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 14. He talks about minds being hard. And he says, 
this. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away, right? And we're like blind to the significance of Jesus, right? Until it's taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, referring to the Old Testament, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Right? We're seeing this veil removed here. And many of you have had this experience, right? Where, where you knew things about Jesus, you could have um, spouted truths about him, characteristics about him, but they didn't even know his trust. It wasn't faith. It wasn't dependence. He was just kind of like, I'm talking about Caesar, right? I'm talking about the president. Like, it's just a historical figure. And then the veil gets removed. And you're like, I see clearly. Right? My stony heart of sin has been removed, and I have a heart that's soft towards King Jesus. And I, and I see, and these things begin to connect and make sense of what used to look foolish. Now it's hopeful and wise. Right? But this is what's happening for the disciples here. And he's telling them, right? My death was necessary. It was always part of the plan. My suffering was necessary. It was always a part of the plan. Right? My life for your life. My death so that you don't have to die separated from God. And my resurrection. Paul will write this in, in Romans. Chapter 4. Verse 24. It will be counted to us who believe in him, meaning Jesus, right? Meaning the Father, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, and who is delivered up for our trespasses, for our sins, and raised for our justification. This is like this simple verse that Paul says, like that, that the Father raised the Son for our forgiveness, for our justification, for our peace, for our hope. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's lifting the veil and helping them understand that all of this was necessary. This was always part of the plan, which he had been trying to teach them and help them understand throughout Luke. That this was the message. And so, listen, it's a reminder to us that all of Scripture is understood through the lens of Jesus. And when we look to interpret or to understand it, it's Jesus. Jesus, that this was no accident. And he's not saying it's this one specific verse that now makes sense. It's that it's helping us understand that the whole crust of Scripture has always been pointed to him and about him so that we would understand this story. And that there were things that were shadows, like the sacrificial system was a shadow where we're going, man, why do we have to do sacrifices? Because there was going to be one final sacrifice. And then that was going to be sufficient. And the priest was not allowed to sit down, Jesus is going to sit down at the right hand of the Father because the work is done and it is finished. Right? These things that we, we understood in part in the Old Testament were shadows so that we would better understand what was coming and what would be revealed to us in the life and in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus. And so he tells them, as they're understanding this, here's the thing. Now, verse 47 the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations. And he's reminding them that the significance of the message is boiled down to is repent. You have misunderstood yourself. You've misunderstood God. And you need to repent. You need to turn from the, the, the behaviors that you've had, the thoughts that you've had, the attitudes that you've had, the knowledge that you've had. All of these things, you need to turn from them towards Jesus. To see him rightly, to see the Father rightly. It may be this morning when you thought of Jesus, or when you think of Jesus even today, you think of him simply as condemning and harsh and judging. Right? Like he's just out to get you. And yet Luke has presented a Jesus who has said judgment will come eventually. But right now there is grace that outruns our sin. And there's a chance to repent and to turn and to find forgiveness. And so have you twisted Jesus into only being judgment? It's not who he is. So you turn from that. Or 
maybe this morning you see him as simply being inconsequential. Right? It's like, can you, maybe there's something out there that makes no difference in my life. It has no significance to me. And we turn from it being inconsequential to see he is the most important person in history. Worthy of my life, worthy of my worship, worthy of my faithfulness and my obedience. Maybe this morning you would simply say, I'm, I'm indifferent to him. I don't, I don't really even want to put in the time or energy to know. And we would repent. We would turn from that. Maybe you've always seen Jesus as, you would never say, say this because people would be offended, but he's a genie, right? And you're looking to use him. You're trying to figure out, how do I get the most out of him with giving him the least of me? Right? I, we, we all have that temptation, right? To want to get things from him, to use him without really giving worship, submission, or obedience. And so what, what Jesus is saying, that whenever we see him, if we don't see him rightly, when it was revealed, when the veil is lifted, then we're turning from this wrong view of Jesus to see the right view of Jesus. And going, I will trust, and I will follow, and I will know, and I, will, and I will want you. That we will agree with him that we have a need. That we will agree with him that we needed rescue. That we will agree with him that we are dependent upon him because we cannot save ourselves. No. And we'll agree with him about his character. Right? This is what repentance looks like. It's not just mental affirmation of knowledge. It is turning from one belief to the right belief. From one perspective to the right perspective. And trusting and knowing and following him. Because what have we seen in Luke as we, as we summarize and wrap this book up? Jesus saw people. Right? As he's walking, he sees people. He sees their brokenness. He sees their need. But right? I think we can make it um, overly, like, sweet. When it's like, oh, there were leopards on the side of the street crying out, Jesus. And the people are like, hey, shut up. Right? Shut up. Then Jesus turns and sees them. Yeah, yeah, that's what Jesus does. But when you've been in a major city, in the U.S. or internationally, and there are those who are on the streets, mentally ill, skin messed up, bodies messed up, lives messed up, you can now imagine someone telling them to shut up when they started trying to draw attention to themselves. Right? And I, oh, yeah, because I try to, like, with eye contact. Right? I think it makes us uncomfortable. This is more the scene of who's crying out for Jesus. And Jesus stops and he sees them and he touches them and he brings hope and forgiveness and joy and healing and life. Freedom. And before we think it's just for them, that's who we are too. Spiritually, it's who we are, that we are destitute, unable to change our circumstances. Unable to change our situation. Unable to pull ourselves out of the muck and mire. Unable to do anything to gain God's attention for him. To say, oh, I'll save you. Right? We are utterly desperate upon the grace of God. And we can fool ourselves into thinking we're okay with our physical lives look okay. But spiritually, we are without hope. Until Jesus sees us. So yeah, yeah. Yes, there's hope. Yes, there's joy. Yes, there's peace. Jesus sees people. And so part of the message that he's telling them here is go see people. And when you see them, then tell them there is hope and there is joy. And it is found in the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Because once again, think about who's in the room here. These are the men who, by the way, have denied him, did not stand with him have remained hidden, have been slow to figure it out, right? Who would ask to pray in the garden or fall asleep, right? Like, it's not like they've just, like, been crushing it here lately. They are flawed, imperfect individuals, and Jesus is there saying, peace, hope, given to himself. Like, what hope for us as flawed, imperfect individuals who have failed Jesus? 
and says, no, 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 you just need it. And I'm gladly here to give it. He's not shaming them. He's not scorning them. He's simply making sure they understand that what they need is him. And so when he comes in the room initially in verse 36 and says, peace to you, he's saying shalom, right? You may have heard this, shalom. What shalom? He literally is saying also it's just salvation. Because shalom is not as simple as peace, meaning not um, fighting, not enmity between us and God, which that is a huge aspect of it. But it's wholeness. It is delight. It is flourishing. Folks, it's Genesis 1 and 2. When God created us to know Him, to walk in harmony with Him, to flourish with Him for all time. Folks, it is Revelation 21. When every tear will be wiped away from our eye, when there will be no more sickness, no more sadness, no more death, no more mourning, no more tragedy, no more dis disease, no more folks not belonging, no more racism, no more poverty. Like when everything is made right and there's flourishing and there are things that are har harmonious forever with us and God, that is shalom. It's peace. And so it's what we see to begin scripture was the intent is where we're headed, and Jesus now steps in the room in the midst of pain and fear and chaos and says, Shalom. Because he's there, and because he's alive, and he has defeated sin, Satan, and death, and he is making us right with the Father. He has closed the gap and has given us the way, the truth, and the life, being Jesus to salvation. And what do they need? Just Jesus. These flawed, imperfect folks simply need to see him rightly and to repent. And he's now telling them, as you do that, you're going to be tasked with something. And so he says, listen, so you are, witness of the, of, you are witnesses of these things. And behold, I'm sending the promise of my Father upon you in verse 40. But stay, or sorry, verse 49. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. The promise here is the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Jesus is saying, listen, when I leave, it's better for you that I leave. So I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And you're not just going to have me sitting at the table eating dish with you. You're going to have the Spirit of the living God within you. Who will guide you to truth. Who will convict you of sin. Who will reveal and lift the veil. Right? Who will be a comforter and an encouragement? Who will empower you and equip you to do the task that I'm calling you to? So go to Jerusalem. You see me rightly and wait for the Spirit of God to fall upon you. And then you're going to have a task before you. And so we see now how Luke is simply the first half of the story. And Acts will pick up the second half of the story. Right? As the mission now goes forth and the disciples have a different persona and a different agenda, right? And they, they carry themselves with courage and with boldness because the Spirit of God has come upon them and they're no longer doing it in their own power, in their own fear, in their own doubt, but in God. And so even the Old Testament confessed that this day would come. Remember Jeremiah 31, right? That there was a hope of a new covenant. We saw in 2 Corinthians 3 a reference to the old covenant and the veil that still covered it. But listen to the hope of the new covenant. Jeremiah 31, 33. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. And I will put my law within them, and I'll write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they'll all know me, from the least to the greatest, declares the Lord. And I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. The covenant, right, is being it's here. And he's saying, so you're going to have this story because you've been my witnesses, and you're going to have the Spirit of God. And then we jump down to verse 50, where Jesus ascends to heaven. This ascension, right, is vindication, right? What did he tell during the trial, right? If we look at Luke 
21. I'm sorry, 22, 69. He says this, right during the trial, um, he tells them before the council, from now on the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. And this is where they lose their mind. I'm like, what more do you need? He's called himself God. Let's crucify him. He's now vindicated because who receives him at the right hand? Father. He is being affirmed that he is who he said he was. We have this confirmation. And we have this kind of beautiful spiritual moment so that disciples knew that was different. He didn't just vanish. He didn't just walk off. He ascended into heaven. I think we have a job to do now. Right? Like we don't need to wait for him to, to come back and tell us something else. When he comes back, everything will be done. We have a job to do. So he ascends. He's confirmed by the Father. But he is expanding and extending his earthly ministry here by affirming the disciples that you take this to the world until I come back. And that is what the book of Acts will do. We are an extension of that. Because until Jesus returns, we've been tasked make disciples, to share the story of Jesus, to call people to the repentance of their sins in Jesus' life, his death, and his resurrection until the day he splits the sky and returns to us. This message is for us as well. We continue this today. And so he tells them, where are we going to take it? Look at verse 47. To the nations beginning in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem is where we start and we take it out. And so this morning, we are recipients of this, right? We are non-Jews who have received this beautiful gospel because folks were faithful to share it. In their generation and their generation and the next generation to their children to their grandchildren to the next country to the next country, right? Which is Genesis 12, 3. I mean, true. God tells Abraham, I'm going to make you a nation, and through your nation, you're going to bless all the nations of the world. We see Amos, one of the prophets, talk about this. We see Isaiah talk about this. I'm going to read just a couple verses. This is Isaiah chapter 2, beginning in verse 2. It'll come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest of the mountains. And will be lifted up above the hills, and all the nations will flow to it. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You, you will see this as well in Isaiah 49, like Isaiah 32. This is all throughout that the nations will desire what the Lord has done. What has the Lord done? He has rescued us through Jesus. Amen. And so we have now been tasked to take this to the world. He is setting up the whole book of Acts in the next generation here. As he ends this, and we'll go into Acts. And so what he's saying is that all of the scriptures about Jesus, and not only is all the scripture about Jesus, then all of life is about him. Right, that whatever we do, whether we eat or drink, we do it to the glory of God. That all of life is worship. Because if we see Him rightly, then we want to praise Him continuously. But that doesn't mean that we simply sit in church and let the world go by around us on their way to hell. That we begin to make differences in how we travel, and how we spend our money, and how we relate to folks how we engage people at work, and how we raise our children, and how we pursue our neighbor. We make decisions that the world thinks are foolish if this is the only life we get. But we know this isn't the only life we get. This is simply the start of eternity for us. And so we can go boldly and confidently, because why? Because Jesus is alive. And because he's returning for us, and he's gone to prepare a place for us, and he's left us his spirit, and he has called us to a task to make Disciples of the nations. That the mission has continued. And this was always the plan. It was always the intent that we were to be a part of it. And so it's actually like an illustration of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10, where he says, right, 
It's by grace that we've been saved so that no one can boast, right? Jesus saves unworthy folks, all of us. And then we walk in the good works he's created for us from before the foundation of time. That we walk in faithful obedience to him to let our light shine before folks that they would say, why are you the way that you are? And so then instead of beating our chest and saying it's because I'm great and you're not, we point to Jesus who is great and say because there's hope and there's peace and there's joy and there's shalom found in his life and his death and his resurrection. And so we go places to put our life at risk. And we pour our life out, not making as much money as we can make. Or pursuing folks in relationships that don't make sense. Because Jesus is worthy of worship. And the nations are going to know. Because the beauty of Revelation is this. That he tells us there will be folks from every tribe and every tongue and every nation around the throne singing praise to our King. From every tribe, from every tongue, from every nation, making much of King Jesus forever. Like the story is going to be finished. We've been brought into it to make much of him. And so Luke is setting up acts for us that we would become worshipers in all of our life. And so we kind of put a pin in this, right? Come. So although we're finishing Luke, Luke has a sequel. All right? And we're going to talk then about mission um, over the summer, what this begins to look like, and we're going to prepare ourselves go into Acts. That we would live lives that would show that we believe Luke 24 and all of them. That Jesus is key. That he is worthy. That he is enough. That the veil has been lifted from our eyes and we want to help others' veils be lifted because the Holy Spirit compels us to make much of Jesus. Now and forever. And that he would be pleased. Let's pray. Father, we want to please you. We want to know you. We want to honor you. Lord, would we not believe the lie this morning that we're going to worship for a few minutes and then worship is over until next week? But that would we know that worship continues as we walk out of this place? As we trust and depend and see you rightly, help others see that as well. And God, when we hear you calling us, calling us to our neighbor, calling us to, to perseverance with our children, calling us to your word, calling us to the nations, that we would make much of you wherever you have placed us. And God, when we head into and the continuation of the story with much anticipation. Um, God, we want to continue your ministry that you call us to. Jesus, in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. So we have an opportunity now to, to sing to King Jesus and sing right things with right hearts and right minds to him. Um, if you need to stand, you can do that. If you need to sit, you can do that. If you need someone to pray with, there'll be folks in the back of the room. But during this time as well, the Lord's Supper has been set up. Because we remember this morning that it was his life, his death, and his resurrection. His body broken, his blood spilled, so that we as imperfect, flawed, separated folks can eat and drink for no cost to us because it cost Jesus. And so if you trust him, if you depend upon him this morning, the table is set up for you to take don't, right, if you haven't repented, if you're not sure that you see Jesus rightly, come talk to us. But would you refrain from the table? It's for those who trust that Jesus is their salvation. Um, so sing, take the supper, sit, let the Spirit minister to you, come and pray, and you respond as God leads this morning. Stand and sit with us this morning as we respond together to the Lord.
Father, we lift up your name today. Thank you for removing the veil from our hearts so that can help us see Jesus rightly. And I pray as we go out this week that your spirit will move in us, that we will see our friends and neighbors differently, and that we'll be emboldened to share the gospel with them. Forgive us when we sin, Father. Let us repent quickly and turn from our sin and turn back to you. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.